Hello, BookTube. As I'm recording this, my review of Gore Vidal's biography has just gone public. And I've already finished another nonfiction book since I edited that. I think I finished it in three days, which for me, that is really unusual speed. So let me show you the book. Let me put it here on the table. I'm doing a, a Marion H. tribute video. <laughs> That's mostly because I've got a cold right now. And I just thought, oh, I don't know, you know, if everybody wants to do my face in those circumstances, right? So we're going to talk about the book this way. This is this is Marion's classic, you know, have a table out. I, I don't have the pretty objects that she's got. So you can see my Kindle and uh, the pencils that I love to use to mark up books. I mean, that's what more does any book lover want to see, right? Absolutely. Now, this is The Madness of Grief by the Reverend Richard Coles. American readers may or may not know this author. The Reverend Richard Coles is a retired Anglican minister and former pop star. Unlikely combination? Yeah, yeah. Unless you consider, of course, both jobs put you in front of an audience regularly, and your job is to keep that audience engaged. Now, Richard Coles is very, very engaging. And I don't know the exact story, but someone from the worlds of Radio and television noticed it. And, you know, as a result, most British people have seen Richard Coles many times on many different television and radio programs. There are pages and pages of YouTube clips if, if you want to know more. I've linked to one, and, and that's just because it was a short that was released just a few hours ago uh, where Richard Coles is promoting Northern Ireland Book Week 2023. Yeah, which is it, it's perfect timing actually, because I began to wonder, was it just a coincidence that I was making this video when he was making that bit, you know, or, okay, I should be serious. But see, the reason I'm going to do a sideline video and not a review has something to do with coincidences. If you want to know about this book, The Madness of Grief is a 177 page memoir that Richard wrote after his husband, David, died. It is his it is his experience of the loss. It covers, uh, I suppose, the period up to and just after the funeral and then some anecdotes, you know, that maybe go forward in time a little bit past that. I bought it. I bought it because Richard wrote it. Yeah. But that's not the only reason. I also bought it because I think the title was the, the, the really biggest sell, you know, to call it madness, to call grief madness, you know, stressing that it's that it's weird, that it doesn't make any sense. I'll tell you the quote that really spoke to me. Let me borrow the book back. It's from page 127. Let me open it up and, and read that to you. Okay, he says, someone sent me an article about the Kubler-Ross theory of the stages of grief, a metric I have always found a bit doubtful, if only for the too obvious convenience of it offering something useful to say in the face of brute fate. In my experience, grief, my own and other people's, does what it wants to do. It is not obedient to psychological patterning or theoretical argument or the opinion of anyone, least of all you. It comes when it comes and it goes when it goes. And it can snatch you out of relative composure with unpredictable and irresistible force. And it is all yours and no one else's. I remember in the 80s when a former lover died of AIDS, someone telling me at the funeral that it was okay to feel what I was feeling. And I thought, where do you get off giving people permission to feel? Oh, see, I was 100% with those sentiments. That was the kind of book on grieving that I was really hoping I was going to get from this, and I did. But I also got some very weird coincidences. i got to tell you, I got three Weird coincidences about acquiring and reading this book. Coincidence number one. I knew that Richard Coles was a minister at the church in Findon, Northamptonshire. And I live in Northamptonshire, but I didn't know that he also grew up in the county and knew it so well. And so I had, you know, while I was reading, I got that, that, that funny feeling you get when somebody knows an area as well as you know it, you know, and they start they start name dropping. 
you know, they start talking about, you know, the, the Warren and Labyrinth of Kettering General Hospital, and you think, oh my God, yes. Or they name villages like Grafton Underwood and Burton Latimer. And you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I loved it we, when he talked about stopping at the at the co-op in Thrapston to buy milk and cheese. I thought, oh my God, what day were you in there? What time? You know, <laughs> because it's a store that I shop in a lot. You know, to do the same thing, just pick up a few a few little things. So I found it really really funny. Um, and I loved it when he would describe a place, but but not name it. And th and then I had to guess, you know, like on page 55, he talks about mooring a boat on a bend in the river. OK, this river has two pronunciations. I call it Neen. Depending upon where you live in the county, it is Nen. And people fight for that. OK, so anyway, he <laughs> moored the boat on the bend of the river near a village with a wooden bridge that crosses the river. Oh, my God. So I was racking my brains the way you do at a trivia quiz, right? Going, thinking, oh, now. And I'm following the river in my head. And I'm going, oh, maybe he means Denford. Denford. No, not Denford. No, no. Wardenhoe. I bet. Does he think it's Wardenhoe? You know. <laughs> so that was coincidence number one. Coincidence number two. On page 133, Richard Coles talks about renting a cottage in Wales this would have been in early 2020 because it was just after David's funeral. So we went into COVID lockdown in March 2020. So it, it must have been very, very early, uh, uh, you know, sort of February or March. And then he talks about visiting Hay on Wye. Hay on Wye, the famous book town, the place where uh, myself and the person who watches television, we've been on holiday there. I can't tell you how many times. We love that place. And when lockdown restrictions first eased up, yeah, I think it was in spring 2021, so that we could drive more than 10 miles from our homes. The first place we both wanted to go was Hay on Why. And it was Hay on Why where I bought my copy of The Madness of Grief. It's just crazy. Richard Coles, he also mentions how much his husband loved the shop in Hay that sold Welsh blankets. Now, there's only one shop that does that. And I have a blanket from the same shop. They weigh a ton. Um, and, but I would own more if I just had, you know, a decent sized sofa to throw it over. So that's two coincidences. I maybe we should do like Marion. Two coincidences. There. Put a hand in the photo just so you know that I am here. I am here. But coincidence number three. Look, this was the weirdest one of all. So I'm going to have to take the book back for a second because I've got to read another passage. OK, it's not going to make much sense, this passage to you. But, you know, just hear, hear it out anyway, because, oh, my God, it, it, it did something to me and I'll have to explain. So in this passage, um, Richard Cole, he's talking about his late husband and, and his late husband's family. So he says the church that his family joined when he was a child, they've since nearly all left. It was what some would call a sect founded by an American radio evangelist in the 30s who believed the British and their descendants were the lost tribes of Israel and so observed the Jewish calendar rather than the Christian calendar, preached the imminent end of the world, required onerous commitment, the stringent observance of rules so marked that its critics have described it as a doomsday cult. Among the consequences of this was David's abandonment of his childhood wish to become a dentist, for he believed the rapture would come before he finished his training and those in the church would be taken up to heaven beyond cavities, gingivitis and tooth decay. The imminence of the end of the world did not prevent the founder from building lavishly in Pasadena, California, most splendid among his works, the auditorium, now home to that city's symphony orchestra. To fund these expenditure, he exacted a tithe on members three times a year, which must have fallen very heavily on uh, David's parents, raising a family of six on their father's wage. David was a little boy when the family joined. His most vivid memory of this was getting very excited at the sight of his parents taking down the Christmas decorations, only to see them thrown out rather than hung up. Christmas was, for the duration of their church membership, cancelled. Oh, wow. First time I read that, silently, my jaw was falling open slowly. And I remember at one point, I shouted out, to the person who watches television because they were in the other room, I said, Bob, Richard Cole's husband was a WCG kid too. 
<sighs> I've got to explain, right? WCG stands for Worldwide Church of God. An organization myself and the person who watches television know very well because we were both members from the late 70s until 1999 when we made a joint decision to stop attending. I spent four years at the headquarters in Pasadena, California, and that is where I met the person who watches television. Uh, probably one of the good things about that time, if I'm honest. And the reason I mention this isn't because I think, oh yeah, you'll all know this, right? <laughs> It isn't, but it's, I'm mentioning this because finding out about this tenuous connection between ourselves and Richard Cole's late husband, I tell you what, it prompted some very strange feelings. I can't label them. I'm not sure if they even have a name. There is a little grief mixed in there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, grief for time that was lost and wasted, but also something else. God, I wish I could find a word for it. It's it's connection. Connection because of everything that was shared, good and bad. I should mention, too, that it was also a coincidence that we know David's brother. The person who watches television is Facebook friends with David's brother, has been for years. And the person who watches television was also attending the Lancaster and Manchester congregations of the Worldwide Church of God up until 1983, when he moved away from the area. And so I think he just missed meeting David and his family joining because that's where they would have started attending. So yeah, it, it, it all very, very weird. I suppose what struck me also about this coincidence is that, you know, however unhappy David's experience of the Worldwide Church of God was, and I imagine for him it was because, you know, he had to come out to his family and, I do remember, <laughs> if I remember anything, I remember the Worldwide Church of God's doctrines on sexuality uh, and on race. And uh, I won't go into them, but they were bad. They were bad. End of. <laughs> okay. But in spite of all that, it didn't it didn't turn David off religion 100%. And, and I got the sense from, from the book that it didn't cause him to despise other people for having faith. I can't ask him obviously. Um, but I wondered whether he went through an experience like I did when he left, because when I first left, I was angry. I was so angry. And I suppose there was a period of madness, like, like grieving, because, you know, you've lost a, a way of seeing the world. And it's completely devastating. You don't, you, you have to start all over again with, you know, what are your opinions on anything? So, so there's anger and regret. And there's a lot of what if thinking, which is very much a waste of time and energy, <laughs> but you do it anyway. I got interested in neo-paganism for a time, but that, that didn't really hold unless you count my ongoing love of tarot reading. But I found myself wondering also, you know, did David feel like I did eventually when I made peace with it all? And when I went to, to read the Bible, and I don't read it often now, but I still do occasionally, and, and it has an effect. And, you know, I can't describe that either. I still have a reaction whenever I hear any portion of Handel's Oratorio Messiah performed. Uh, I sang that as a soprano in the chorus on the stage of that Pasadena Auditorium in 1983. I don't believe any of the lyrics that I memorized then and sang then. And yet, for some reason, they still produce a reaction as if I did. Yeah. But I know better because I can imagine some Christians thinking, oh, maybe you still have faith. And I go, oh, just be careful. I know, I know better than to think that it is faith uh, because I did so much thinking after I left the church. I had to really look hard at myself. And, and the conclusion that I came to was that I, I didn't have faith. I didn't have real faith in any of those years that I attended church. I, I think for me, I had always been a very dreamy, highly imaginative child and you know what I was really good at was suspending disbelief and I was so good at it I wouldn't even know I'd done it <laughs> and and I guess I'd have to say in retrospect that's what I was during the time that I was Christian I wasn't I wasn't a Christian with faith I was a Christian suspending disbelief very effectively for a while um, anyway uh, for what it's worth that's my little digression 
about the madness of grief and and why it was such a, a cool book for me. I want to do one little shout out. Marion H., can I apologize, please, for not responding to your latest comments? And, and also, I want to say again that I really, really enjoyed your review of The Power and the Glory. And I'm hoping that you might be inspired to, is that's, that's probably is the right word, isn't it? Inspired to say more about the Christian authors, the other Christian authors that you found insightful. Okay, thank you to everybody else who checked into this video. Look out, there's another Middlemarch meditation coming up soon. I hope you've had a really good weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.